Thank you. So if you don't know, for the last five weeks, we've been going through a series where we've been looking at Old Testament prophecies and are seeing how they've been fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. And so today we're going to be looking at another prophecy um, and its fulfillment, but we're not going to be looking at a prophecy of Jesus specifically, but of his forerunner, of someone who would go before Jesus and would prepare the way. And so before we get into the text and before we begin, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day that we can gather as your body of Christ Jesus and we can learn more about your word and worship you, Father. So right now, God, I pray that you would soften every heart here, Father, that we would be open and willing to hear what it is that you have to say to us today. God, that this um, word would fall on good soil, Father, and that it would bear much fruit. Ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so today, like I said, our passage is going to be talking about the forerunner of Jesus, who scripture makes clear is a man named John the Baptist. And similarly to Mary and Joseph, who are the parents of Jesus, John the Baptist's parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, were informed of the birth of their son in a very unique way. They had been married for many years, but they had never had any children. And not only was this disappointing for for the couple, but others saw it as a shameful thing. Jewish society at the time looked down on people who could not have children. And they unfairly assumed that God was not pleased with them, and that was the reason why God was withholding children. But in fact, the opposite was true. And the angel Gabriel, the same angel who would later appear to Mary and Joseph, appeared to Zechariah and gave him the incredible news that his wife would bear a son and that he would do great work for the kingdom. Actually, John the Baptist and Jesus would be related, and they would be related through their mothers, um, but the relationship between them is not certain. They could have been cousins. Mary could have been Elizabeth's niece. It's not known for sure. We just know that they were, in fact, related. And so that's just a quick summary of John's birth, and if you're interested in reading more, I encourage you to do so in the beginning of Luke. Um, But this background information leads us to our text today, and we're going to be looking at how John the Baptist came prophesying the judgment that awaits sinners and calling on his hearers to repent. So let's get right into it. And our first point for the the day, we're going to be looking at the message that we see in verses 1 to 6. And verse 1 says, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea. So Matthew begins by showing us that this account is a historical account. He begins by saying, in those days. And with this in mind, we can understand that both John the Baptist and Jesus are now grown men. John the Baptist is beginning his ministry, and Jesus is about to begin his ministry soon. And we know that Jesus began his ministry when he was 30 years old. So with that in mind, we know that both of these men are grown up now, and some time has passed. And the passage says that John the Baptist came, and he began preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And John's message was clear, and it remained the same. And verse 2 tells us that he went around preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, that's a pretty big and strong word that we see at the beginning of John's message. It's the first word that we see. But did you know that it's also the first word that we see in the beginning of Jesus' ministry when he's preaching in Matthew 4, 17? And it's also the first word that we see when Jesus sends out the disciples to preach, calling on the people to repent in Mark chapter 6, verses 12. All throughout the New Testament, we see this idea of repentance as being at the forefront. And so clearly, this message of repentance is important to God, and it's important to Christ, and so therefore, it should be important to us. And so what exactly is repentance? The Greek word for repentance is metanoia, and this word is actually an action word. All people, no matter who you are, no matter where you came from, have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. And this sin separates us from our holy, heavenly Father. He is so holy that we that he cannot be in company with sin. And so God sent his only son, Jesus Christ the Messiah, the true reason for this Christmas story, this Christmas we've been celebrating. God sent Jesus to die on the cross so that through his sacrifice, we could be reconciled to the Father, our sin could be paid for, and we could live in relationship with him. You see, repentance is the action of forsaking sin and turning to God. And notice how I mentioned that it's an action word. It's not just a feeling word. It's not like, oh, I feel really remorseful for my sin. I'm really sorry for what I did. 
No, it's a metaphorical changing of direction. It's feeling sorry and remorseful for what you did, but doing something about it. It's turning away from our sin and turning to our loving and holy Heavenly Father. John's message was the Messiah, the King is coming, so repent and return to him as a response to this good news. He wanted the people to know that the kingdom of heaven was near. And the kingdom of heaven is the reign that he brings about through Jesus Christ. The person of Jesus is connected to the kingdom. And John is saying, Jesus will shortly appear, and with him, the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven wasn't distant. It was a very near thing, and this is why John is so, like, urgent in his call to repentance. And so, some time has passed, and Jesus is born. This is just a, like, a glimpse in the future. He comes to earth to do his ministry, and we see that the kingdom of heaven is a present reality, and it's a present reality for the people who John is ministering to, but it's also a present reality for us. And in his message, John is pointing to the fact that this kingdom is a present reality, and, and it's also a future promise. And so Hebrews 9, 28 says, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So if the coming of Jesus is connected to the kingdom of heaven, and we see in this passage that Christ will appear a second time, then we know that the kingdom of heaven is also a future promise, one that we're still waiting for even today. And so if the kingdom of heaven is at hand, if it's a future promise, then we must get ready. We here must ask ourselves if we are ready for the kingdom of heaven to be near. Are we ready to meet Jesus and to stand before him on judgment day? And then in verse 3, Matthew identifies John the Baptist as the one who would go before Jesus, which was prophesied about in Isaiah 40, verse 3. Isaiah prophesied about the Lord's messenger, crying out in the wilderness. Matthew says, for this is he who Isaiah spoke about. John the Baptist is the messenger for the Lord, and his purpose was to prepare hearts for the Messiah and to bring an awareness of sin amongst Israel so that they could turn and receive the salvation from sin offered by the Messiah. This voice, John, is saying that our God is coming to reveal his glory worldwide, and the people need to prepare to meet God. And here Isaiah makes a reference of preparing the way of the Lord to make his path straight. And in the ancient past, when it was known that someone of power was coming, every effort would be made to make sure that the road was as smooth as possible so that these, this person could travel as easily and quickly as possible. And this same preparation is what John is encouraging people to do in their hearts. Smoothing out a road is very much like the preparation that God has to do within our own hearts to level out the high and low sections and smooth out any rough spots. Every obstacle in our lives must be removed. This preparation has to be moral and spiritual. This is the preparation that John would preach. And John's message of repentance would prepare the way of the Lord. And John did this really well. And we too have the responsibility to evangelize and to prepare the way of others. I think oftentimes we can think that the Christmas story ends with Jesus in a manger or ends a few months later when we celebrate Easter and Jesus dies on the cross, but the truth is we have a responsibility in the story to play. We have a part that we have to be a part of, and we must prepare the way for Christ to work in the lives of others. Now in verse 4, Matthew turns his attention to the messenger, and he describes John's clothing and diet which tell us something important about him. It says that John wore a garment of camel's hair, which would have been coarse and probably really cheap, and that he wore a leather belt. It also says that he ate locusts, which if you didn't know is a bug, and I think I would personally really struggle with that one. But he eats locusts and wild honey, and these, both of these things would have been um, easily accessible to John in the wilderness. And the impression that we get from this description of John is that there was nothing seemingly elaborate or attractive in the way that John dressed and that he didn't seem to live this elaborate lifestyle. His simple food, clothing, and lifestyle were a visual protest against self-indulgence. Instead, John was satisfied with simply living out his mission to evangelize. And as I was preparing for this sermon, this verse really stood out to me. 
And as I ask myself, and I now ask you, am I as satisfied to simply be doing the work of God, even if that means I have little? Or am I so caught up with having all these materialistic things that I'm disappointed and dissatisfied when I don't have all this long, extravagant list of the things that I want? And now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that it's wrong to have nice things, but if our source of satisfaction comes from having these materialistic things and not from Christ, his work in our lives, and our mission to evangelize, then it's wrong. It's sinful, and our priorities would be way out of focus. And it can be easy for us to fall into this trap of thinking, oh, well, I need these material things so that I can share the gospel of Jesus. You know, I need a nice house and good food so that I can have people over and be hospitable, and then I'll share the message of Jesus to them. Or I need nice clothes or the latest book from the hottest author that says, like, six ways to prepare to evangelize. You know, we think we need all of these things. But friends, and I'm speaking to myself here too, that John the Baptist's lifestyle and ministry shows us that we don't need elaborate clothing or an elaborate lifestyle to share the message of Jesus effectively. We need love for Christ, obedience to him, and reliance on the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us, and that's really it. So Matthew then begins verse 5 with then, or at that time, which we see as his way of giving us a general timeline of John's ministry. It says, then Jesus, sorry, then Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So Jerusalem, of course, indicates the inhabitants of that city alone, but we must understand that when Matthew is saying all of Judea and the region about the Jordan, that this covers a much vaster area of land, meaning that John would have been reaching much more people. The author is saying that large numbers of people were coming from the areas of population to John's lonely area. It was a rarity for there to have been such a prophetic figure at that time. And so people were coming from far to hear and to see John. Although John was far away, although he was in the wilderness, he did not lack an audience. And he wasn't doing miracles, but people wanted to hear him. They were drawn to the message that he had to share. And Praise God, because John's ministry was met with wonderful response. And in verse 6, we see that there were many people who recognized their sinfulness and their need to prepare for the Messiah, and they were willing to repent and turn to God. You see, John's call to repentance was met with exactly that, as the people responded by confessing their sins. And it's important to recognize that this, this idea of personal repentance would have been a new thing for these people that John is ministering to. They would have been familiar with collective or group confession on the Day of Atonement, or they would have been um, familiar with individual confession in specific cases, but this idea of like spontaneous self-confession would have been completely countercultural for these people. But it's when we truly understand the gospel message like they had done, when we truly understand just how far away we are from God and the lengths that he has taken to bring us near again, that is what leads us to repentance. We can sit at church all day and listen to sermons all day long, but if we don't understand that we are all sinners and that we need a savior and that our sin has separated us from our creator, the one who loves us so deeply, then we're missing the point. So these people had repented. They were baptized in the Jordan River, but it wasn't the baptism that had saved them, but the repentance that happened first. Without this acknowledgement of their sin, being baptized in the Jordan would have simply been like taking a bath. It has no spiritual significance. You see, baptism doesn't grant salvation, but it demonstrates that someone has already repented and been saved. And in that time, the Jewish community was already practicing baptism, but this baptism was typically among Gentile people who wished to become Jews. And so for a Jew in this day to submit to baptism was essentially them saying, I I, um, confess that I'm as far away from God as a Gentile, and I need to get right with Jesus. I need to get right with God. And so that's what they did, and many people repented of their sins and were baptized. And as I was looking into this, I realized that this word baptize is actually a verb, and it means to dip or to plunge. 
And in the passive form, it actually means to be drowned. We don't drown people when we do baptism, though, but this word is used to describe ships that sink. We should not miss the significance of this imagery because it shows us that baptism is death to a whole new way of life. And the message is the same for us today. Baptism should follow after our repentance. It's a public declaration of our faith, and it signifies that you are dead to sin and alive in Christ, as we see in Romans 6, 11. So if you've repented of your sins and are in relationship with God but have never been baptized, then I strongly encourage you to do so and to make this public declaration of Christ's work in your life. And if that's you and this is something you're considering, then I'd like you to think about being baptized at our next baptism service in March. And while we're on this topic, I just wanted to, to mention that I often hear people say that um, they're not ready to be baptized because they still sin sometimes or they still fall or they sometimes miss doing their devos or whatever. And I want you to understand that if this was the requirement, if the requirement was that after you repent that you never ever fall again or that you're a perfect Christian, then not one person sitting in this room would have ever been baptized because that's not a requirement that not any of us are able to fulfill. You see, baptism is a public declaration of your faith. It's not a statement that you've perfected your faith. And as we move on to verse 7, we're going to notice that it's not just the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Judea, and the surrounding region who come to John in repentance. You see, many Pharisees and Sadducees attended John's baptism as well. And you might be thinking like, wow, look, these religious leaders are flocking to John. They also want to confess their sins and repent and be baptized as they await the arrival of their king. But that's not exactly what happens, and so let's look at what John says to them in verses 7 to 10 and the warning that he brings. Let's begin with just verse 7. It says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And so here we are introduced to two important groups in first century Judaism, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees were a legalistic group who strictly kept the law of Moses and the tradition of the elders. This term, Pharisee, actually derives from the word separated, and the Pharisees viewed themselves as God's separated ones, and this resulted in that the Pharisees tended to view themselves as higher or greater than other people. And at the same time, they focused so much on legalistic details of the law and the tradition that they often missed what it was that God was doing. And the Sadducees, on the other hand, they were more politically minded, and they had theological differences with the Pharisees. But they cooperated with the Romans, which resulted in them having political power. They saw Jesus as something of a danger, for he might provoke a movement in opposition to Rome. And together, these groups, they represented the leadership of Judaism. And while these two groups were very different and were often in conflict, the one thing that united them is that they were in opposition to John and they were then later in opposition to Jesus. And as I had mentioned before, many people from all over were coming to hear John. People were drawn to him. And in this verse, we see that the Pharisees and the Sadducees also appeared. But John doesn't meet them with, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Is this your first time? We'd love to get together with you. Fill out a welcome card, please. No, he doesn't meet, with, he doesn't meet them with that. He boldly calls them brood of vipers, which means offspring of sn snakes, offspring of the serpent. And essentially, he's calling them sons of Satan. And Jesus also calls the Pharisees brood of vipers in Matthew 12. But why is John doing this? He's accusing the leaders of wanting to appear anxious for the Messiah, but not truly repenting and preparing their hearts. And he backs up this statement with the question, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? John's implying that these religious people had no real repentance, but only desire to escape the wrath of God, and which is his judgment upon everything that's in opposition to his holy nature. And with that in mind, in verse 8, John demands fruits worthy of repentance. He says, bear, produce, make fruit that exemplifies repentance. 
John wants to see not simply the words that express repentance, but he wants to see evidence of repentance through actions. He says bear fruit, not bear fruits. You see, the singular is important because John's not encouraging people here to just pile up a bunch of good works. You know, we know that good works do not save people. And in Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, um, we're reminded that it's not a works-based faith, but that this grace is a gift from God and is the only reason that we are saved. So he's not looking for good works. Instead, John and God is looking for a change in the orientation of the whole way of life that will result in fruitful living. You see, bearing fruit will naturally result from our repentance. Real repentance will show itself in our lives. John is saying that it has to be a matter of living repentance, not just talking repentance. And John is making it clear that simply being present at a religious center is not enough. It wasn't enough then, and it's certainly not enough now. Even today, there are many people who say they are living rightly before God, but the fruit in their lives doesn't exemplify repentance. You see, it's not enough to just come to Centerview Church or any other church for that matter and listen to the word of God being preached and sing songs and maybe even volunteer if every aspect of our life is not changed. There must be fruit in our lives that Christ is working within us. And this brings us to verse 9 where it says, And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. So John hammers in this previous demand with a reference to the Jewish pride that these people have from being descendants to Abraham. He's saying, do not say to yourself, or do not think to yourself, or do not try to justify your refusal to repent. And I think it's important for us to understand that to many Jews, it would have been an unthinkable concept to them that a Jewish person could possibly not go to heaven. You see, they believe that all of them, no, just, no matter what they were doing, simply because of who they were related to, because they were related to Abraham, they believe that all of them got like a free pass to heaven. But that's not the case. John is saying that salvation does not come as a birthright, even for the Jews, but that it comes through faith in Christ, through repentance and relationship with him. God was looking for more than a complacent claim of relationship to Abraham for the Jewish people, and he's looking for more than these claims in our life too. And for me, as I was growing up, my parents and my grandparents who are here today, they were, they were pastors. And so for much of my childhood, I grew up in church and I relied on my parents' faith. You know, I never really made faith my own until I was a teenager. But I assumed, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm doing all things that Christians should do. Um, so that makes me right in my relationship with God. I was like the Jewish people and just how they assumed that they were in right relationship with God because of Abraham, I was doing the same thing. And it wasn't until I recognized that I was a sinner, that I needed a savior, and that my parents' and grandparents' relationship wasn't going to be my relationship with God, that I needed my own relationship with him, that I turned to God for myself and developed my own relationship with him when I was a teenager. And the truth is, if you're relying on your parents' faith like I was, or your spouse's faith, or your friend's faith, or maybe you're even friends with the pastor and think that God's going to give you extra favor because of who you're associated with, but if any of these describe you, then the truth is that you're living just as far away from God as I was. And then John says, for I tell you, as he speaks with authority and commands the listeners to hear what comes next. And it's likely that at this point, he's like pointing to some stones beside him as he says, out of these stones, um, God can raise up children for Abraham. And essentially what he's saying is that being children of Abraham was no great matter, for God really could put anybody there. God did not need these specific people to accomplish his purposes and fulfill his promise. And so their relationship to Abraham wasn't enough to grant them salvation, it wasn't about who they were related to, but about the posture of their heart. 
And in verse 10, John furthers his point as he continues to bring out the seriousness of the position of those who do not generally, genuinely repent. He says, even now, showing that the judgment that he's about to describe is a present reality. He says, even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. And this axe was a symbol of destruction. And the fact that it's lying at the root of the trees paints us a picture of the death that is to come. The root of the tree is where the tree draws its life and its sustenance from. And so this picture suggests that as the tree is cut down, its source of nourishment will be taken away. On the day of judgment, those who are found unfaithful will be removed from the source of life, from Jesus Christ. There is no such hope for the tree, which in this case represents a person who is living far from God. John says every tree, meaning that it's not restricted and it's not, um, there's no exceptions. Friends, we must not think that we can get away with our sin. The truth is trees that do not produce fruit in keeping with repentance will be cut down and destroyed. Not only will the tree be cut down, but it'll be thrown into the fire. And this should serve as a warning for those who are not in relationship with God. And you might be thinking like, wow, Katie, you're being a little bit intense today. But I'm being intense because I see that John is also intense because this is a serious matter. It's not something to take lightly, and I hope that you see my heart and that I'm saying this out of love. But if you've not repented of your sin and turned to Christ, then on judgment day, when you stand before Jesus, you will be cut off from him who is the source of life. And yet God did not want this to be the case. So he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross so that if we repent and believe in him, this will not be our destiny. Friends, repent of your sins and turn to Christ who is the source of life. My final point to, for today is the proof, which we see in verses 11 and 12. In verse 11 says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So John's baptism was one of repentance, which he's been talking about. But John moves to his contrast with a but, and he contrasts himself with the greater and the mightier one who is to come. This word greater contains the idea of strength, of power. Christ would be more powerful than his predecessor, who is John. Christ is so powerful that John sees himself as not worthy to perform such a simple task for the great coming one, and he he illustrates this with this idea of carrying sandals. And the important point here to note is that carrying sandals would have been a task that only slaves would perform. And so it's a mark of John's humility when he says that he is not worthy to perform this simple task for Jesus Christ that even that not anybody else but a slave would perform. Instead of becoming proud of the crowds that he drew and the response that he saw, John recognized his own place before Jesus Christ. My prayer for us today is that we would never become so arrogant in our own lives, and our own ministry, and the things that we're doing, that we place ourselves above Christ, who is so much greater than we are. This great one, John says, Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John's saying, Jesus will do so much more for you than I ever could. Jesus would bring these people and would bring us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would indwell believers and purify them, which is shown in this baptizing with fire. And verse 12 says, His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, and the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So John concludes this passage with a metaphor of judgment. And he's referencing what would take place during a harvest, when grain would be thrushed with winnowing forks, where someone would shake the grain free from the husks. This would simply represent the wheat being separated from the chaff. And Sorry, you see, farmers would want the wheat, but the chaff would be useless and would be discarded. And so here, um, they're talking about final judgment, where the righteous, who are the wheat, would be separated from the unrighteous, who are the chaff. Christ will clear his threshing floor, meaning that all of the earth will be judged and separated. 
He's saying that the winnowing fork is in hand, meaning this process of separation is about to begin. The chaff will be burned up with fire. Those who are right with God will be preserved, while those who are far from God will be separated from him forever. You can stand with me as I close. So this entire passage is pretty heavy, and it talks a lot about judgment and repentance. And I hope that you've been able to hear my heart as I've shared from this. But, but God's word is clear that all people will be judged, and the righteous and the unrighteous will be separated, and the unrighteous will be separated from God forever. And so if you've never done so before, then I encourage you to surrender your life to Christ because there's no like more joy and fullness of life than you will ever experience than with Christ. He died for your sins and for my sins and so that we can live in right relationship with Jesus Christ. And my final thought is just as we're getting ready to enter into this new year, my encouragement for all of us here would be to live as John the Baptist has exemplified, to share the good news to all people with love, whether gentle or harsh at times, and in all that we do, that our goal and our mission would be to point people to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, our Savior and Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word today. God, I pray that as we go into worship, Father, I pray that you would continue speaking to us, Father. I pray that you would lead and guide us um, to steps that we need to take of obedience, Jesus. And God, I pray that this word that has been fallen, hopefully on good soil, Father, I pray that it would bear much fruit, Jesus, that we would go and that we would share this good news of what you've done for us, Father, with other people. God, that this would be our desire and our goal, Father, that we would long to know you and to share this good news with other people. So, God, I pray that you would just be with us for the rest of this service, God. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.